So it's good to be um, good to be together again. Good to be with you again. Um, the theme of uh, of today's session is working with impermanence, working with impermanence, working with change. Um, how, um, how that can be a, a doorway to to real to genuine freedom to deep freedom. Um, so we'll the format we have is a pretty simple one. We begin with a, um, a period of meditation, about twenty minutes or so. Then um, then I'll give a talk, you know, something in the region of twenty five or thirty minutes. Emily will lead us in some movement, in some mi mindful movement, and then uh, then we'll have some time for sharing probably in some in small groups today and then we'll come back and uh, have a final meditation a short of ending meditation and some announcements to uh, to finish off so I hope you're all doing well um, it's really good to to be together and uh, to practice together support each other in our practice so we'll begin with a with a set so for this i invite you to just get as comfortable as you could be whatever your posture sitting lying be as comfortable as you can be <coughs> if you like you can <coughs> excuse me Like you can <clears throat> let your eyes gently close, bring your attention inward. Just check in with the body, just let the, the body and the mind arrive, settle. <clears throat> it's inviting the shoulders to relax. Let the chest be open so you can breathe easily. <clears throat> Let your hands rest comfortably in your lap or on your knees. And allow your attention to kind of drop out, down out of the thinking mode. Just come down into the body. Feel your body in contact with the with the surface beneath you. Feel your feet touching the floor. <coughs> your hands touching your lap or one hand touching the other. Consciously taking your seat and letting yourself arrive and be here. You might give yourself <coughs> give yourself permission to be here, to let go of thoughts about the future, thoughts about the past. Just bring your awareness to your breathing. You might invite the breath to deepen, taking a nice deep full in breath and a long slow out breath. Breathing in, calming the body, breathing out, calming the mind.
as you breathe in, just know that you're breathing in. And as you breathe out, know that you're breathing out. Just this simple knowing of our experience. This moment, just as it is. Let your awareness come to the body and just notice what's present right now, what sensations are here. Making space for whatever is here. Letting the feelings come and go in their own time. I bring awareness to any mood or emotion that you're aware of right now. Maybe there's lightness or there's some heaviness, some joy or calm, or maybe there's some worry or tightness. Whatever is here, see if you can just make space for it. Allowing what's here to come and go in its own time. It's bringing a kind non-judging awareness to your experience. Bring awareness, <clears throat> bring awareness to your mind. Now just notice, is it active, is it quiet? Are there lots of thoughts? Or is it fairly quiet and still? However it is, just make space for what's here. there is a lot of busyness, you can just kindly choose not to follow the thoughts. Maybe just let your attention rest on your breathing, breathing in and breathing out. <clears throat> See how it is right now to Look at your experience through the lens of change. Things coming and going, rising and passing.
So a breath coming and going. A feeling of discomfort coming, staying for a while and then passing. Does anything stay? Can you see it all coming and going? Just notice what happens if you don't get into a struggle with your experience. You're wanting pleasant things to last or wanting unpleasant things to be gone. But just bring a, an attitude of kindness and acceptance to what's here. What happens when you do that? Does everything just come and go? Feeling your breathing, breath coming and going. <clears throat>
if you find yourself pulled into to any story in the mind kind of takes you away or an experience that you're resisting say a bodily feeling just see if you can invite uh, a letting go or a letting be just making space for what's here letting the feelings come and go in their own time when they're ready to pass choosing to let go of the story in the mind In the, <clears throat> in the Diamond Sutra it said, Thus shall you think of all this fleeting world, a star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, a phantom and a dream. If you choose to look at your experience through the lens of change, of impermanence, you can explore, does anything shift when you do this? Does it allow some space, kind of a different understanding of your experience? Does it help in any way to let go? Let go of holding, let go of clinging.
What do you notice when you approach your experience through this lens of letting go, of change, of impermanence? Is there a wanting to hold on? Or is it possible just to see the an experience as just part of this changing flow, this impermanent, constantly changing flux of life. Finish with this death death poem from Kozan Ichikyo, fourteenth century Zen monk. Empty handed I entered the world. Barefoot I leave it. My coming, my going, two simple happenings that got entangled. Empty handed I entered the world. Barefoot, I leave it. My coming, my going, two simple happenings that got entangled. <clears throat> Again, welcome everyone. <coughs> um, what I'd like to uh, what I'd like to do in the talk this morning is to kind of build on the theme of impermanence. Um, and I'm over the coming weeks. I want to talk about what are what are called the uh, the three characteristics of, of existence or three marks of existence three you could call them fundamental truths about about life um, what i like to see them as is as three ways of looking at and investigating our experience that lead to freedom so looking at them as um, ways of looking or lenses through which we can look at our experience. I'll say a little bit more about that. But these three characteristics, some of you will be quite familiar with them, but they're impermanence, um, called anicca in, uh, in Pali, A-N-I-C-C-A, -C -C -A, anicca, um, unreliability, transience, change, impermanence. The second is unsatisfactoriness, you know, things not feeling, you know, not being the way we want them to be, not liking how things are. The word is, in Pali, is dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A, which is often translated as, as suffering. But I, I think the, the word, word unsatisfactoriness captures more of kind of the dimensions of, of dukkha than suffering does. 
And the third is non-self, the absence of a, a permanent self to which this is all happening, you know, that somebody can, you know, we can lay claim to, this is my body, this is my, my emotions, my thoughts, that any of that is solid or permanent. Um, the Buddha teaches is um, um, it is and, and itself isn't to be found. But the invitation with each of these is to to explore these these ways of seeing, these ways of looking. And I want to begin today with the first one, impermanence. Um, but before talking about impermanence, I want to just share a few reflections about um about mindfulness and about insight and the role that these three characteristics or three marks of existence play within the buddha's teachings and practices um so the, uh, what i'm i'll say now will be you know well known to some of you but not necessarily everyone i, th I think there can be some confusion about about terms and terminology you know, we often use the terms mindfulness and insight in a kind of interchangeable way. You know, sometimes we call what we do here mindfulness meditation, and sometimes we, you know, it's called insight meditation um, to talk about, you know, this this practice that comes out of the, you know, specifically out of the <clears throat> out of the Buddhist teachings and and more specifically out of the um the teachings in the Theravadan tradition of Southern Asia, of Thailand and Burma and Cambodia, you know, which are kind of a different body of teachings, although going back to the foundations, the same foundations of suffering and the end of suffering. But having, you know, almost 2,000 years, you know, of, being, of going in different directions, having, you know, very different expressions even though they are very much, you know, all around suffering and the end of suffering, ending suffering. Um, so we often use these terms interchangeably, but mindfulness and insight actually play different roles in the movement from suffering to freedom. You know, if the, if the, the, the journey on the Buddha's path is out of delusion and out of suffering and towards freedom, Mindfulness and insight both play very fundamental roles, but not the same role within that journey, if you like, the journey to freedom. Um, you know, as we're probably everyone is aware, mindfulness is kind of a non-judging awareness that we bring to our moment-to-moment -moment experience. So if you were, being, were, were practicing mindfulness in this moment, you would be kind of connected with your bodily feelings and whatever's going on in your mind and you're hearing the words you're taking it in and you're really just being present for whatever it is you know this moment is 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 bringing <clears throat> in or showing up as um and we can bring i think as you know we can bring mindfulness to every aspect all aspects of our life we can bring our bring awareness to our breathing to our body to our emotions to our thoughts to our intentions to you know what's going on in the world to our communication with others you know we can bring mindfulness to to all really all aspects of our our experience and our life um, and the buddha said mindfulness he called it the direct path to liberation, direct path to nirvana or nirvana, the path to, to, to freedom from suffering. So what is this direct, direct path? Well, when practiced diligently and the Buddha in his teachings and particularly in his best known teaching on mindfulness, what's called the Satipatthana Sutta or the teaching on the foundations of mind. Very, very clear and precise instructions of how we should practice, you know, diligently with attention, mindful, free of 
desires and discontents, kind of putting aside, you know, hindrances and things that trouble us and really be present for whatever it is we're experiencing. So when practiced diligently, mindfulness leads to insight, leads to seeing clearly, insight and seeing clearly, <coughs> excuse me, are really synonymous, you know, insight is seeing clearly. So mindfulness, when we practice diligently, can lead to or leads to insight into seeing things as they really are. You know, insight that that actually frees us from suffering. So you can see mindfulness as the practice, the process, and insight as the outcome or the fruit. We practice mindfulness in order to see clearly. So mindfulness is the, you know, the way we engage with our experience in order to understand, see clearly. So the, the fruit of mindfulness is insight and the fruit of insight is freedom. You know, when we see clearly, we untangle ourselves from suffering. So mindfulness, when practiced skillfully, leads to insight. And insights in the Buddha's teachings can be described as liberating or transformative ways of seeing. So insight, an insight is a, a, a liberating way of seeing or a, a, a way of seeing that actually changes things, that transforms. So it's not just a conceptual or intellectual understanding. Intellectual understandings, we might get something, oh yeah, I, I understand impermanence. I get that everything is gonna end. You know, that would probably, you know, that would be an intellectual understanding. Almost everyone in the world of a certain age understands impermanence intellectually, you know, and, you know, unless, you know, you could believe in Santa Claus or the, the Easter Bunny or whatever. Um, you know, you can believe in different things. But but basically, I think we know that everything comes into being and ends. Um, but it's different knowing that intellectually, like knowing it as an idea and getting it as a transformative insight. If it's a transformative insight, it will change everything about the way you look at the world and look at your experience. That's the nature of insight. Genuine insight transforms. It frees us. It untangles us. It unhooks us from, you know, what we might be hooked in. So that's a really important distinction. It's a fundamental distinction because intellectual understandings are not going to get you very far. They might be, they can be helpful, yes, they can be useful, but they're actually not in themselves transformative. You know, it's insights that really help us, um, help change us, help free us that matter. Um, so the teacher that I've mentioned at different times, I think is really, really clear in talking about this. And the name of the book he wrote on emptiness is called Seeing That Freeze. Seeing That Freeze. That's a Rob Berbea, Berbea. Seeing That Freeze. It's, it's insight that actually leads to freedom. You know, that's, that's the only really meaningful insights that the Buddha was concerned about, that we pay attention, we bring awareness to our experience in order that we can see clearly, for example, where we're hooked, where we're caught up in suffering and how we can let go of suffering so that if we can see how we do that, then we can experience, then we can know genuine freedom. Then it becomes a seeing, a way of seeing that frees the door, if you like, of, of suffering. So it's seeing that changes us, that untangles us, that frees our heart. 
And some of the most important insights we can gain on the path to freedom from suffering are to see clearly into these three characteristics of existence. So they play a pretty important role in the Buddha's teachings. And they're basically, you know, they're teaching that all conditioned things are impermanent, they're unreliable, and they're not me or mine. The, the reason really they're important is because when we see clearly that that we can't hold on to anything, it tends to give us ways of letting go of suffering. Because if we're holding on tightly to something, and then there's the understanding that it's impossible, I can't do this, then there's much more possibility of, of letting go. So these ways of seeing these three characteristics of existence are um, are potentially um, provide insight that frees us from suffering that's why they get a lot you know they're given a lot of um, importance in the buddha's teachings they're not the only ways of seeing there's not the only ways of seeing that can free us. You know, if we were to choose to look at our life through the lens of compassion or loving kindness, for example, that would be also a way of looking, a way of seeing that would potentially be very freeing. If you were to go out into the world today, maybe every day, with the, <clears throat> with the intention of looking at everyone through the eyes of compassion, of loving kindness, of, lo of love, and really intentionally and consciously looked at everybody and everything that arose through that lens. You know, rather than you're bothering me, you're annoying me, you're wasting my time, rather than the things we often do, you know, seeing people in our way, we consciously see everything as, you know, a, a potential to, to uh, uh, as having the, the potential to, for us to, um, to care about them, to, to love them. When we look of, at the world and life and others in this way, that way of seeing also would be a way of seeing that is potentially a, a liberating way of seeing that, that really allows us to let go and allows us to open our hearts fully. So there are many different ways of looking, but these are three that, that are very important in the Buddha's teachings because um, they, they, they have potential for, for freeing us from suffering when we see clearly. So when we see clearly into anicca, dukkha and anatta, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness and non-self, it helps us let go of clinging. And we can see that, that nothing can be held on to as I or mine. So we can look at the, we can use these three characteristics as ways of looking at our experiences of our at our experience as lenses that allow us to investigate whether this is in fact the case because really we're, we're talking about investigation i want to emphasize we're not talking about these aren't beliefs about the world you know the be believing that the world is changing you know it is, I think, a truth, but it's not something that we hold on to as a belief. It's more a way of seeing, a way of looking that potentially frees us from suffering. So just getting in for it for a little bit, getting into the, um, the first of these three characteristics, impermanence. I think it's probably the easiest of the three characteristics to understand on an intellectual level. Because most of us get 
that everything comes to an end. You know, nobody here is in denial about the fact that they're going to die. I mean, each one of us is going to die. We know this. Probably we'll all agree that civilizations end because we've seen examples of them in the past and we we know you know we know that that everything comes to an end we know that you know the time of the dinosaurs ended and other periods you know whether in deep history or more recent human history even planets end i think we know that you know in six billion years or something like that i don't have the precise uh, coordinates but we're gonna you know burn up you know we may do a lot of harm before then but um but um you know that's what's uh, on the agenda based on the previous you know what science tells us about the previous 13.7 billion years um so it's easy, it's not it's not hard to understand impermanence on an intellectual level, but it's not so easy to get as an insight, you know, to see it more deeply so that our knowing of impermanence actually frees us, kind of untangles us, frees us from suffering. There's a, a line, a, a piece in the great um, Indian epic the Mahabharata where uh, Yudhishthira is asked um, what is the greatest wonder in the world what is the greatest wonder in the world and Yudhishthira answered that people see death all around them and don't believe it's going to happen to them people see death all around them and don't believe it's going to happen to them and you know that's that that that's true i think you know we don't live very much in the light of death you know and we can and 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 there are practices and folks here are, are, are many are familiar with them you know a year to live practicing as though you only had a year to live you know and being very conscious and intentional you know um, as uh, Don Juan in the Carlos Castaneda book speaks about having death on your left shoulder, you know, how much that in, can inform life. You know, you imagine you have your death right here, right close by all the time. But we don't tend to live in that way. We kind of push death and aging into the, you know, out of, you know, out of the center of our, our gaze, you know, it kind of reminds us of things that maybe we'd prefer not to think about, you know, like, no, I'm thinking about my vacation. I want to have a good time. I want to enjoy my life. But, you know, the truth is that the more we live in the light of death, the more fully we can, we can live. The more we live in the light, you know, in the truth of impermanence, the more we can live fully as well. Um, so, part of so it's, it's it's easy to get but not so easy to get at a deeper level and on a, a kind of a transformative level we've really got to pay attention um and practice with impermanence as with death and dying so at the heart of the buddha's teachings is the understanding that the whole world of our experience the outer world and the inner world is fundamentally impermanent, that it's in flux, that nothing has really any solidity to it. Even the things that we see are solid are always changing. Nothing, nothing, um, nothing lasts forever. It's always in flux. The Buddha's last words to his followers were, all conditioned things are impermanent strive on with diligence so everything that comes out of the a cause everything really we know in this human realm is impermanent everything is impermanent is changing he says strive on with diligence he didn't say all conditioned things are impermanent therefore nothing matters therefore go out and get drunk you know whatever he said strive on diligently it does matter 
in the light of impermanence, still everything matters, everything's changing, but it doesn't mean that everything is unimportant or that nothing is important. It's a kind of holding those two things. And really the essence of these teachings of impermanence are that rather, you know, we might think that with everything changing, then nothing really has any meaning. Um, but the truth is that, that, um, that when we really get impermanence on a deeper level, um, life actually becomes, we, 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 we can see life more fully, appreciate its beauty more, its fragility amidst the changes. You know, in the way that we, we love the cherry blossoms, the loving of cherry blossoms, I think, is that they're here and gone. You know, I see that uh, Tom Don has uh, his uh, avatar there of the, the cherry blossoms um, and uh, and also uh, Anne. And uh, <laughs> we're fond of the cherry blossoms and understandably because they're beautiful and they're and they're changing. They don't last. And, you know, the, they come back to um, William Blake's uh, lines of um, he or they who cling to himself to himself a joy, who binds to himself a joy, does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies, lives in eternity's sunrise. So we can find in the midst of, in the midst of, um, you know, the challenges of life, we can, we can appreciate the beauty that comes with everything changing. So we, in one, on one level, we get change, we get impermanence, but we t tend not to really um, live from that understanding. You know, whenever we, we are kind of wanting things to be a certain way, wanting things to be a particular way and, and trying to cling to things, like I've got to have this, I want this, or I want to get rid of this, um, when that when we do that we suffer because we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to hold on to what can't be hold, held on to really we're trying to make what is impermanent permanent you know i want this to last forever you know not just in a metaphorical sense but there's a real sense of when there's that holding on there's suffering because life doesn't comply with our wishes Life will be life. Life will come. Things will change. Loss will come. All of that will happen. And our wishes, in a sense, uh, won't, won't, you know, don't impact on, on the truth of impermanence. So if we take that, you know, as, as a, you know, as a proposition, then Freedom comes from acknowledging the truth of change, of impermanence, and finding peace in the midst of change. That's the, that's the, that's the freedom that the Buddha points to, you know, and other wisdom teachings too. That it's not, the, the freedom doesn't come from being able to hold on to or make things permanent, make anything last. Even the most exalted states in meditation or, you know, in any practice um, won't provide lasting ha happiness. They won't give us, provide freedom. It's only, um, it's only through opening to the change, the impermanence of life, and the truth that nothing can be clung to, and that nothing is permanently me or mine, that in the midst of all of that, we can find freedom. That's the freedom that the Buddha points to, that doesn't, um, that doesn't deny change, um, doesn't make things permanent or give us something that we really can cling to. 
it doesn't create a, 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 a solid permanent self either. But in the midst of all of this flux and change, freedom is possible. You know, what we tend to do is if something unpleasant is going on, then our mind tends to tell us that this is going to go on. You know, if we knew it was going to be gone in a split second, then probably we could let it go very easily. But the mind creates the illusion that of things being permanent. You know, we tend to look at the past and say, well, the past was like this and the present was like that is like this. So therefore, that's really, you know, we can easily solidify things from the past. We can connect dots up and then we project the dots into the future and we create a solid scenario. This, you know, we get scared about it. We get worried. We get anxious and fearful about things that might happen, which is only all it is, is the mind filling in projections for the future. It's not the truth of how things are. But we do this and we suffer. You know, we suffer when we create these fearful scenarios and, and things that might happen. So when we deny impermanence, when we try and hold on, we act as though our possessions or our relationships or our work or whatever are things that we can hold on to. Then we suffer because, you know, life doesn't go along with our wishes. It's always changing. And when we see this clearly on the level of our direct experience, it's freeing. We can find peace amid the changes. There's a um, story, it's often told, told in, in different ways about Arjun Chah and his cup, you know, that he used to drink out of, and he loved his cup. He got caught, here it's, he called it a glass. I love this glass. It holds the water admirably. When the sun shines on it, it reflects the light beautifully. When I tap it, it has a lovely ring. Yet for me, this glass is already broken. When the wind knocks it over, or my elbow knocks it off the shelf, and it falls to the ground and shatters, I say, of course. But when I understand that this glass is already broken, every minute with it is precious. So if we can understand the glass is already broken, you know, we can then we can enjoy it we can we can see its beauty we can see its function um, we can love it but we don't have to be distraught when it breaks you know when things change and this is the relationship that we're cultivating you know they, they, you could call it dancing with life you know life will bring along joys and sorrows and you know, in a sense, our role is to learn how to dance, you know, not to grab the one, the things we like and try and hold on to them for dear life and push away the things we don't like and don't want anything to do with as though we could get rid of them forever. That's a recipe for suffering. But if we can get into that dance, you know, that, that relationship, that fluid relationship with life, then then we can find freedom amidst the amidst the challenges amidst the difficulties so there are many ways i'll just finish in the next couple of minutes and we'll have move into the movement but i want to just say that there are many many ways that we can work to deepen our understanding of impermanence so that it really is freeing you know it could range from the kind of reflection it could be a contemplation on you know on life you know thinking about how tangled up we get in 
certain things in our experience, certain, you know, trouble we have with somebody at work or a family member or the political situation. And how, you know, when we think about it, if you thought about, well, you know, what were you worried about five years ago, you know, or 10 years ago, or even five months ago, you know, was it exactly the same thing? Maybe it was something completely different. And now, you know, the mind has kind of congealed around a particular thing now, but another time it was something else. It's all that, you know, what, what tends to be common is that until we find our way out of it, we get, we cling to things, we get hooked on things. If you were able to step back and just reflect, maybe lying down under the stars and looking at these stars, which have been around for billions of years. And we thought about, you know, how the universe has, you know, from the Big, Big Bang, it's been, I think, 13.7 billion years. And each of us, let's say we live to be 80 or something in the region of 80 years old, we'd have to have 150 million lifetimes, 150 million lifetimes multiplied by 80 years wouldn't even take us back to the Big Bang. You know, all of this change over time, all of this coming and going over these billions of years. And, you know, even just that reflection can um, perhaps give us some, um, some sense of space, some sense of, of ease, some sense of maybe even of letting go of saying, oh, this is, you know, this is just a small moment in this infinite, you know, deep, deep history of billions of years. That can be one way of looking at it. We could look at a day in our own life and you may be at the end of the day, look back and say, you know, what did I notice in terms of the different bodily feelings I experienced, the different moods and emotions I experienced, the different mind states during the day? We look back and seeing them all, you know, oh, maybe I was a bit grouchy in the morning, but I was happy in the, in the afternoon. And then I had a really joyful time in the evening with friends. We see how, you know, it all kind of goes, comes and goes. And yet, we suffer when we get hooked into parts of that. We get hooked or hooked into wanting things. We want more of this stuff and less of that stuff. And yet we see it's all changing. When we see that, maybe we can get, you know, a shift in our, have a shift in our relationship to our experience and easing off a letting go. And as Arjun Chah says, you let go a little and you'll experience a little freedom. You let go a lot and you'll experience a lot of freedom let go completely and you'll experience complete freedom. Your struggle with the world will be at an end. And all of this practice is really to end our struggle with the world, not to end our engagement with the world and our caring for the world, but end that sense of like, I've got to make it the way I want it to. You know, that wrestling with life rather than dancing with life, trying to pin life down. Good luck with that one. You know, that um, life will be life, you know, whatever we, however we want it to be. So can we, can we find, can we find that peace, that ease? That's another way of doing it. Another way we can work with, with in, um, impermanence is when we are caught up in something, maybe we can see, okay, can I, can I experience this? Can I know that this is going to change? Because on some level, we do know it's going to change, but we haven't kind of got it deeply enough. So we stay hooked in that unpleasant emotion that we kind of, we don't like, but we're stuck here. Okay, this is changing. Can I just let, let my foot off the gas, as it were, or step back and just allow change to do its own work? You know, so there are many different ways we can work with impermanence. We did a little bit in the meditation. So the invitation is to um, to just 
bring this lens of impermanence, this way of looking at the experience more consciously into your meditation and into your daily life in order to be able to gain insight into the nature of, of change, of life to change, so that we can free ourselves, we can free our hearts from clinging. Because the more clearly we do see impermanence, the more we let go. It's like we realize that the rope that we're holding on to is burning our hands. And we see, oh, I can let go of this. I can let go of the rope and I'll be okay. And I don't, I, I won't, I won't burn my hands in this way. I won't suffer in this way. I didn't share this yet, did I? In passing, Lisa Muller. I think I shared it this morning in the other group. <laughs> anyway, it's a nice poem. How swiftly the strained honey of afternoon light flows into darkness, and the closed bud shrugs off its special mystery in order to break into blossom, as if what exists exists so it can be lost and become precious, as if what exists, exists so that it can be lost and become precious. So hope that there's something in there that may be useful, reflecting on impermanence, bringing it into your life more consciously as a way of seeing, as a lens, and seeing what happens when we, when we do see more clearly and does it create the conditions for letting go, for finding some freedom in our lives and point to even deeper possibilities of, of letting go? So thank you for your kind attention. I'll pass it over to Emily and we'll have some movement. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Let me invite you all to stand up, feel your feet and just sway allowing your arms to open up and lift one heel as you turn in the opposite direction, just exploring and feeling the air against your skin. And then open up wide and reach up Lengthening your arms up, exhale, lower your shoulders down. Grasp your left wrist in your right hand and extend out to the right, opening up that left side, breathing into the left rib cage. Exhale, soften. Inhale, back up, switch wrists and extend out to the left. Again, breathing into that right rib cage and soften here. Inhale up, float your arms down, roll your shoulders independently, allowing each shoulder its own movement and roll the other way. Come to center, draw your hands up and your elbows, hands open wide, and then exhale, draw the hands down, leaving the elbows up. Inhale, rise. Exhale, low. Inhale, rise up. Exhale, low. And rise. Extend your arms out. Turn and look at your uplifted left palm and then switch, turning up your right palm, the left and the right. Last time to the left and then the right. Float your arms down, roll your shoulders together. And roll them the other way, yeah. 
Good. Draw your hands behind your back at the waist. Inhale, lifting your head, lifting your chest. Exhale, draw your hands down, lengthening your arms back to the waist. Again, lifting your head and chest. Exhale as you draw your hands down, engaging those shoulder blades. And release, float your arms up. Dance in any way you might wish to. Windmills or whatever. Suits your fancy in this moment. And then place your hands above your knees. Come into a flat back, extending your spine away from your pelvis, pressing on your feet. Inhaling deeply, exhale, draw down, however low you might wish. Feeling comfortable. Dropping your chin to your chest, lengthening with the exhale. Deep inhale in, exhale with a sigh. <sighs> and then place your hands above your knees, soften your knees, and start to roll up, stacking the vertebrae, keeping your head down to the left. Draw your shoulders around the ears and exhale. Find yourself in mountain pose. Turn your palms out, lifting your arms up overhead. Come to prayer position there, feeling your center line. Exhale, draw your hands to your heart. Feeling the warmth there. Turn it out to the group, wishing people well. Exhale, draw your hands down. And with your next breath, bring your arms overhead. So whoosh. Again, drawing your hands to your heart, turning your kindness to the group, down to the earth. And whoosh, bring your hands down to your heart and take a bow. Thank you everyone for your practice. Thank you, Emily. That's lovely, lovely. I'd like to just check in with you how, how it was, if there's anyone had has any questions or something to share um please feel free we could take a couple and then we'll have a meditation and then some announcements to finish um anyone um anyone like to share anything either in the uh, in the chat or in in words diane diane um yeah hi diane go ahead oh you're you're, you're muted so. okay there got me yeah um, grateful to be here. I was thinking about, well, aging was part of what it like. My body getting older. I've got my 67th birthday coming up this week. And my body's changing. Um, and I've got, had a variety of things this past year, which has really let me know um, things are changing. Um, but I was thinking about like using the glass metaphor or whatever, just like if I, okay, if I think about my body is already broken or going to die, then all this wouldn't come as such a surprise or wouldn't be, you know, um, that sense this shouldn't be happening. This is, this is not how my, my body, you know, my body is strong and healthy and able and, you know, it's transient. That That's transient. I mean, I've, been fortunate to have the good health I've had as um but just sort of that idea of thinking okay this isn't something that's not supposed to happen or seeing myself as broken somehow or breaking you know in a negative way and our culture is so stay young stay you know look this way act this way you know um and 
that's not reality. Um, so it helps to kind of ponder that some and sit with it, you know, sit with it and sort of see if I can be with that. And also there's so much medical intervention available now, sort of figuring out what to do and you know how far you want to go with trying to combat <laughs> different kind of aging processes, disease processes. It's um, so that, again, that's something that's to look at, but it's the idea that you always have to fight some illness or disease or intervene is very prominent and so a lot to work with. Thanks. Thanks, Diane. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, you think of, you know, that the, the extent to which our culture is in denial, you know, and elevating, you know, things, you know, being young, being beautiful, being, you know, all of these things and, and others being, well, no, we don't want that. And yet the reality is that, you know, everyone who's ever been born, you know, has who's lived long enough has got, old and has got sick at some time and has died and so to in some we you know to to resist that and to deny that is a is a recipe for suffering and yet there's a lot that pushes us in that direction you know we have a lot of signals and messages but when we you know that's why it's so valuable i think so important to come back to these teachings and remember you know it's it's of this body is the, of the nature to die, you know, when the time comes, you know, and so um, it's a training really to to really cultivate equanimity in the midst of change, you know, that this if it's if it's true that the body is of the nature to get sick, get old, die, etc., then clearly it's lunacy to deny it <laughs> i mean it's like it it's just craziness and yet we often you know we often do crazy things you know we we, we kind of we want to hold on you know we want to be in denial we want to you know deny that you know we are getting old or we're looking older or whatever um how would would it be just to say okay this is this is the nature of things and and it is a training because you know it's not necessarily easy in the face of all the things kind of going in the other direction you know including our own internalized views of how how things should be or how we want them to be but um but good that you're uh, you know that you're you're wrestling with working with with that and you know I bow to you and everyone for that because it's not you know, what do they say? I mean, getting old isn't for sissies or, you know, whatever. You know, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, it's not an easy thing. You know, when the bodies do start falling apart, then, you know, that's not easy and it's not pleasant. But, um, but recognizing it's the nature of things is, can be a huge support for us, I think. I know. Um, you know, Achala, yes, that, that um, will you want, want to share? Yes. Hi. Oops. Um, yeah, it was almost a, just getting into the group was like a metaphor for my life. It was um, such a challenge to be present technologically. And I'm just seeing my um, determination to be present in life. I'm almost crying right now. Um, and not using my age. I'm 62. I'm not 90 or 101. And I'm um, not using my brain injury as an identity or an attachment or an excuse to not connect. Um, but rather... Um, and I'm seeing my determination and looking to others 
to um, get present technologically and finding and how that brings me such joy to give others the opportunity to be of service and connect with me. And, you know, I used to joke around, the young people are our future. And I was really, I was too young to be saying that like a little in the little old lady voice back then. But, um, you know, I, I see how my dreams are pulling me back to other times and other lifestyles and other, um, just other, other than where I am now. Um, and I also saw, I also experienced and realized during, I was aware that um, my bodily pain, I'm only aware of it, um, this shoulder pain, which is really intense, and this like scratching and itching on my ankle. I know I'm being very specific, but um, I, I'm hoping for some <laughs> answers here. Like my willingness to be present and aware of that only happen when I'm sitting in meditation or lying down to go to sleep. And probably because I do yoga nidra at night when I go to sleep because I've been having trouble with my sleep. So um, I just, I'm just thinking about the dignity of people, especially people such as yourself, who um, continue to give and operate and engage in the world regardless of age, with dignity and um, in, in acknowledgement of themselves and the circumstances as they are. And that's, that's how I choose to be. And I'm, I'm actually humbly proud of my renewed resilience and determination to do so myself and finding my people and people to collaborate with to help me to do that because I really, I'm at a point where I can't do it myself. I've allowed things, my my home and other things have lost their shape. <laughs> mm. And so it's easy to be pulled into stories that that seem more pleasant when really reality as it is second by second is bittersweet and sparkling and fine. Mm. So I hope I made some sense. I have no idea. And... And often when I say that to people such as yourself, I'm told it doesn't matter. So now I'm quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, what you I think what you shared was really, really helpful and and uh yeah, good to hear how you're how you're holding all of that and, and working with it. Um with the challenges, you know, challenges of, you know, physical conditions and and aging and uh yeah, my own uh, my own attitude. I, I, you know, I take Bob Dylan as a model. You know, he goes, he's out, he's out at eighty one, you know, heading for another joint, and uh, he's singing, and you know, we'll you know we'll die in the saddle, and uh, I think that's a good a good model. I mean, as long as the the mind and the body hold up. Um, and you're doing what you love, and you know, hopefully it's helpful. Then um, you know, why, why, why not? You know, continue. Um, you know, and um, and enjoy. You know, and 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 connect all the connections around it. So, um, yeah, it's it's an area I think of of. Um, easy to easy to be deluded around um you know for myself i i've 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 had really good health all my life and you know my mind's holding up and so it's easy for me to go into a place of thinking well this will just keep going on forever and yet i know it won't you know and and yet so having that awareness to know you know to be aware of signs, you know, when the signs do show of, okay, you know, this is happening or this is happening or this isn't happening or whatever, um, to, you know, to acknowledge the truth because, it, you know, it is the truth for all of us. You know, we will, we will get old. We'll, these are the, you know, the five remembrances in the, in the Buddha's, you know, the Buddha's teachings of sickness, aging, death, loss. And that the only thing we own really is our own our own actions, our own karma, and uh, and remembering that, and pra doing practices of remembering that, you know, often and daily, 
um, is important because otherwise we easily just get in get lost in our delusions. So, so thank you, for, thank you for sharing that. We'll we'll finish with uh, Denise and we'll have a short meditation. Oh, we, yeah, we. Uh, go ahead, Denise. Yep. Thank you. I had um, I shared in my small group about a friend of mine who is in assisted living over in Utah, and um, another friend here in Albuquerque. We we moved her here because she was needing more care. And um, my friend drove here and it tells of the story of how this friend who had been declining physically for many, many years just couldn't get over the mountains. You know, she hadn't been outside for about a year and the scenery in the West and what a joyful ride that was to bring her here to Albuquerque. And she... Um, she had arrived, and speaking of the change, there was a COVID. In, or they, um, when she arrived, they hadn't told her, but she was going to be in quarantine for two weeks. And then that, that just that two weeks made such a difference, you know, not being able to get out in her physical being, and um, just one thing after another. And then she eventually was uh, in hospice, and my other friend here had such a hard time accepting, you know, the things that we couldn't change about what had happened and the reason why eventually she was completely bedridden and in, you know, not moving for weeks. And I love how in yoga, you know, we practice Shavasana, you know, for that time in our lives. And um, she, um, she just passed on Friday. And one thing I didn't get to share in the small group was how we um, there was a natural burial here just south of Albuquerque. And uh, we took her out there and, you know, it's this barren land. Of course, we're in an extreme drought. And it was in the, um, the Manzano Mountains. We're just beyond. And we lowered her into the ground, you know, surrounded by several other people who have come to this. 80 acre spot and there was train tracks and cargo trains that would go by and just how beautiful that was and how stark and true and pure it was really lovely so mm. I just that thank you thank you Denise thank you that's lovely thank you for bringing that in and allowing all of us to to hold that experience and her passing and her um, burial. Thank you so much. Let's just finish with a, um, a couple of breaths, maybe breathing in a wish of kindness to yourself and wishing kindness, compassion to everyone here. May you be safe and happy and free from suffering, held in loving kindness to yourself and going out to all beings everywhere. May all beings be held in loving kindness, filled with loving kindness, free from harm. There uh, is no charge, no cost for this class, but you're invited if you'd like to, and if you're inclined to, to make a donation to support um, to support me and my teaching. And uh, it's, it's a tradition of dana or generosity is how the teachings have come down through 2,500 years, 100 generations, and we're committed to keeping the practice going today. So. These are the different ways you can do the provide uh, sendana. Thank you.